The season has started. We're underway, but we want to stay sharp, sharp with our rules, understanding how to adjudicate plays. Let's look today at some questions to help ensure that's the case. Stick around. Greetings and welcome back to another episode of the Basketball Rules Expert, the show where we take National Federation of High School Basketball Rules, lift them off the printed page, breathe life, simplify, clarify, and amplify so that we can take the rules with us onto the basketball court where it is most important. Greetings again, everybody. My name is Greg Austin with a better official I've been a high school basketball official here in the San Francisco Bay Area for over a decade. I consider myself knowledgeable about the rules of high school basketball, and this show is all about helping you on a journey to becoming a basketball rules expert as well. If this is the video content that you find valuable, be a great time to do all the things. Hit like, subscribe, and notify so you don't miss out on any of our new content. We live stream two times a week. Join us for the live stream as well. Allow me a moment to thank our tremendous show supporters. Jeffrey Jewett, Gary Mouton, Ashton Dillon, Dan Kelly, and Les O'Connor Jr. Much appreciated and much love. You want to support the show? You know there's going to be one. There'll be a link in the show notes below. Tremendous. All right, today we are going to look at rules questions, get a firm understanding of the rules so we can go on to the court. You know it's what we do. Let's get started. Today we're going to get started with some really simple fundamental concept rules questions. Let's look now at our very first one. After obtaining initial legal guarding position, the guard may move in which of the below directions when contact occurs? A. Laterally. B. Obliquely. C. Backward. Or D. All of the above. Really straightforward. Gets to the essence of how we evaluate guarding, right? Guarding is the act of legally placing your body in the path of an opponent, right? Once initial guarding position is established, legal guarding position is established with two feet on the floor facing the opponent. Once that's established, that defender is allowed to move laterally, obliquely, or backwards by rule. Legal. And understanding that basic concept of the establishment of legal guarding position and then what the depend defender is allowed to do legally by rule gets to the heart of what we do as basketball officials, right? So our correct answer here is all of the above, right? Really straightforward. Legal guarding position is established. After that, our defender is allowed to move laterally, obliquely, and backward to maintain that guarding position. This is really meat and potatoes stuff, right? This is what we do all the time as basketball officials. We're evaluating ball handling, whether that is done legally, and we are evaluating guarding and really understanding basics of guarding, what the fundamentally is all about, how, it's a, how legal guarding position is established, and how legal guarding position is maintained are at the heart of what we do as basketball officials, an absolutely essential component that we have to learn to evaluate and adjudicate correctly. So our first question today gets us started. A super simple, basic concept. Let's move now to another simple question. How many free throws are awarded for an intentional foul? A, one free throw in all situations. B, no free throws if committed by the team in control. C, one free throw if committed on a successful two-point or three-point try. D, two free throws if committed 
on a successful two-point try and three free throws if committed on an unsuccessful three-point try, right? Understanding what the penalty is for an intentional foul is something that we can know at all times. It's a basic concept. We can take that with us onto the basketball court. The penalty for an intentional foul is two free throws to the offended player or their eligible substitute and the ball awarded to the team at the spot nearest the foul. Except in the one instance where the uh, intentional foul occurred during a three-point try that was unsuccessful, then we would award three free throws to that offended player or their eligible substitute and the ball to the team at the spot nearest the foul. So on this question, our correct answer is D. It is two free throws if committed on a successful two-point try, right? It's not an and one in that situation. It's always two free throws. And on an unsuccessful three-point try, it would be three free throws. So again, this gives us a simple, simple fundamental concept, how to adjudicate an intentional foul. What is the penalty for an intentional foul? It allows us to take that simple understanding with us onto the basketball court so that we can get plays right when they happen, right? We can, you know, maybe it's a hard foul and we're upgrading to intentional. There's high energy in the building, et cetera. All of these things are, are in play. We can maybe get distracted, but this fundamental Again, this is a simple concept that we can take us take with us onto the basketball court. We have an excessive foul play, right? Player goes to the basket, hard foul, right? We come in with excessive contact. What kind of energy do we expect in the building, right? Everything goes up, it's animated, etc. There's confusion, hostility, things we have to resolve. We can get distracted in those situations, right? But if we just always maintain the, the understanding of how, what the penalty is for an intentional foul, we could s settle all that stuff down. Now we're going to enforce the penalty, two free throws to the offended player or their eligible substitute, and the ball to the team at the spot of the foul. Simple, straightforward. All right, let's get looking now at another simple rules question. The following results in a traveling violation if a player with the ball lifts a pivot foot and then A. Passes the ball B. Shoots the ball C. Begins a dribble or D. Drops the ball to the floor, right? Which of these is illegal by rule? Fundamental concept again. Once a player lifts a pivot foot, they may not start a dribble. That's simple. That's straightforward. We can get behind that, right? What, you know, sometimes a player will uh, lift their pivot foot and do other things. They can always shoot the ball. They can always pass the ball. They could always, if they have player control, request a timeout. All of these things are legal by rule, right? So we need to just identify what is illegal. And what is illegal in this situation is that a player in this situation is not allowed to begin a dribble. Our correct answer here is C, a simple concept, one that we need to know and we need to own, right? Uh, so that we can go on the court. And that's what these first three questions today are doing. Just simple stuff, basic meat and potato stuff that we need to know when we go onto the basketball court. We like the simple. All right, let's now take a look at our very next play scenario. A1 is fouled, but erroneously is not awarded free throws, even though the bonus is in effect. Team A is given a throw-in, and after the successful throw-in, A2 and B3 cause a held ball. The error is discovered during the dead ball that follows the held ball. 
The possession arrow favors team B. How is play resumed? A. Play resumes with the results of A1's free throws. B. It is too late to correct the error. C. A1 is given a one-on-one -on -one free throw attempt with players occupying the positions on the free throw lane. Or D. A1 is given a free throw attempt with the free throw lane cleared, followed by a throw-in for Team B. Okay, so we have a correctable error situation, right? Merited free throws were not awarded when they should have been. Anytime we're faced with a correctable error scenario, we have to determine, are we within the correctable error time frame to fix? And what will happen next? When presented with this situation, the first thing that we have to do is, hey, ref, hey, ref, right? So we, had a, we erroneously awarded the ball for a throw-in instead of merited free throws. The ball was passed in, and at some point, a held ball resulted. Team B has the arrow. So in the absence, if we did not have a correctable error here, if nothing, you know, we were just playing basketball, what would happen next, right? Team B would have a throw in. We need to know that. So we we now get presented with the information. Hey, ref, we should have shot one and one there. Okay, great. What happens next? The reason this play is so important is that if we think about the correctable error scenarios, right? The ones that are going to happen the most, the one that absolutely is going to happen the most is not awarding merited free throws. We should have shot bonus free throws and we didn't. Now we're presented with a situation where the table says, hey ref, we should have shot bonus free throws, right? This is going to be the most common of the correctable error scenarios. So dominating this, this one play Unmerited or merited free throws not awarded is going to give us our best bang for our buck in terms of understanding correctable errors. So in this situation, we need to know whether there has been a change of possession. We gave the ball to Team A. Team A inbounded the ball. Basketball ensued. A dead ball occurred. At this point, when the dead ball occurs, has B, Team B in this instance, gained possession, or is it simply in the possession of Team A? Imagine this scenario. Instead of a held ball, we give the ball to the thrower. They pass the ball in. Horn sounds. Hey, uh, 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 hey, ref, ref, ref. Should have been one on one. Has there been a change of possession? No. No, there has not. How are we going to resume? We are within the correctable error time. We're going to award those merited free throws. We'll have players in marked lane spaces, and that is how the game will resume. Now we have our play scenario here. The ball is inbounded. Basketball is played, and then we have a held ball situation. Team B has the arrow. Our point of interruption here is Team B throw in using alternating possession. So our possession has gone from team A to team B. So in this instance, to do it correctly, we are going to resume with a team B throw-in, alternating possession arrow throw-in at the spot. Prior to that, we're going to shoot the merited free throws with the lane cleared and then resume with the AP throw-in because team B had gained the ball in that instance. So our correct answer here is D. A1 is given a one-on-one -on -one free throw attempt with the free throw lane cleared, followed by a free throw for Team B. And that's really at the heart of the matter here is understanding, okay, we failed to award merited free throws. We're in the correctable error time frame. Are we going to award those free throws with the players in marked lane spaces and resume the game from there? Or are we going to clear the lane shoot the free throws, and then do something else, right? So those are the things that we have to know um, to properly adjudicate these plays by rule, right? So this one play, though, really gives us our best bang for the buck, understanding what to do when we failed to award merited free throws. It's going to happen much more frequently than other scenarios. All right, let's look now at another correctable error play scenario. Thank you.
When there is a correctable error for awarding an unmerited free throw, which activity during that unmerited free throw is canceled? A, a common foul. B, a technical foul. C, an intentional foul. Or D, a flagrant foul. If any of these occurred during an unmerited free throw, which would be canceled by rule. Okay, so this is a situation where we have, uh, let's say we awarded two free throws, double bonus, when it should have been one and one. Player misses the first free throw and then attempts the second free throw, right? This second free throw is unmerited. Since it was should have been one and one, that second free throw should not happen because they missed their first. So during this second free throw, right? We have a player in the marked lane space who displaces an opponent, right? Oh, a foul is ruled. And at this point, the table says, hey, ref, hey, ref, that should have been one and one, not two. Okay. All right. Imagine this scenario. This is going to be a bit of a puzzler. It's going, we're going to have to slow, or we have a foul. We're going to report, are we within the correctable error time frame? All of these things come into play. So in this instance, we are going to disregard the common foul because it occurred during an unmerited free throw. Really rare circumstance if you think about it. First of all, that you're going to have a correctable error for an unmerited free throw. And secondly, you're going to have a foul during. Okay, But the rules say if we have a foul during, then we are going to disregard the foul, rescind the foul as it were, because it happened during unmerited free throw activity. But we're not going to disregard egregious behavior, technical foul, intentional foul, or flagrant foul. Those will not be. Okay, so that's the key, gets to the heart of the question here. And our correct answer in this scenario is A, we would disregard a common foul in the situation where we are have a foul occur during an unmerited free throw right? Again, very rare, but something we want to have the understanding of so we can adjudicate plays properly. If you imagine this play actually occurring in your game, this is a pretty wild scenario, you know, that we're going to have to unravel. So, well, let's think it through, right? So we, we are now, um, we had an unmerited free throw. That free throw, let's say, was um, successful and the foul occurred, you know, as players were positioning. Table says, hey, ref, 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 right? And then we have to unravel and what we have. Okay, that second free throw, we should not have shot. We have a common foul during the ball went in the basket. We are going to cancel the goal. We're going to cancel the foul. And what's our resumption of play, right? The first free throw, which was merited, missed, right? So in this situation where we don't know who will get the resulting throw in. So we're going to go to the possession arrow in this instant, cancel the goal, cancel the foul, use the possession arrow and resume play at the spot nearest to where that first free throw missed. So it'll be just outside the lane area. A wild scenario if it happened in our game. It's good to think it through here so that when we happens out there, we're better prepared to do it. All right, let's move on now to our next rules question. All of the following are ruled as correctable errors except A, the failure to award a merited free throw and permitting a wrong player to attempt a free throw, B, erroneously awarding the ball to the wrong team for a throw in and making a field goal in the wrong basket, C, attempting a free throw at the wrong basket and erroneously can counting or canceling a score, or D, none of the above, right? So a, a kind of a strange pairing of items here, right? But the failure to award a merited free throw is a correctable error. Permitting a wrong player to attempt a free throw is a correctable error. So that A is wrong. And if we look at C, attempting a free throw at the wrong basket, 
that, uh, that is a correctable error. And erroneously counting or canceling a score is correctable error, right? So let's now look at B. Erroneously awarding the ball to the wrong team for a throw-in and making a field goal in the wrong basket, right? When we erroneously award the ball to the wrong team, we recognize, uh-oh, we have screwed up. We want to make things right. We are eager to say, oh, oh, oh wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, right? We're going to fix that, right? Team A was given the ball. It should have gone to team B. They throw the ball in. They dribble, dribble, dribble. We recognize, you know, somebody, the coach says, hey, wait a minute, right? And we want to fix it, right? But NFHS rules specifically says, no, no, you cannot fix it once the throw-in ends. And knowing when a throw-in ends, when it's legally touched inbounds, is critical to uh, adjudicate properly. But our correct answer on this play is B. Erroneously awarding the ball to the wrong team for a throw-in is not a correctable error. And if a team puts the ball in the wrong basket, um, that is a goal scored. That is not a correctable error as well. So those uh, answer B is our correct answer on this play. And that's given us a little bit of an overview of correctable error scenarios with those questions, right? And we can always get better at, <laughs> at correctable errors. When they happen in your game, that's always a, a significant challenge. The challenge of it with the correctable error is always going to be related to the fact that we have to then, we have to think back and reconstruct what has occurred over a period of time. And that's not normally what we do as basketball officials. Normally we officiate in the moment. And so the correctable errors always present a challenge. All right, let's look now at another rules question. After team A scores in the last 10 seconds of the second half, and before the ball is at the disposal of team B for a throw-in, A1 grabs B2 in an effort to have a foul ruled and save time. A1 is whistled for an intentional technical foul, and team B is awarded two free throws. Where will the ball be put in play for the designated spot throw-in? A, team B's choice. B, at the division line opposite the table. C, along the end line for a non-designated spot throw-in. Or D, at a designated spot nearest to where the intentional technical foul occurred. Right? So we have a, a unique situation. It's an end-of-game scenario. The ball goes in the basket before the ball is at the disposal of the thrower. We have a foul in an effort to stop the clock. This is dead ball contact. This is an intentional technical foul by rule. If we have an understanding of what that means, what's the penalty for a technical foul? In National Federation of High School Basketball rules, it's really simple. We can always take that with us on the court. Any we are going to award two free throws for any technical foul in high school rules. Two free throws for it by any player or eligible substitute and the ball for a division line throw in opposite the table. Each and every time that is the correct adjudication. So in this end, this question, our answer is B at the division line opposite the table. Right. In this instance, we could get distracted like, well, no, they need the end line throw in should result. Right. And we don't want to take away their up. No. Tactical foul, simple. Two free throws, division line, opposite the table. Don't need to overthink it. The key here is identifying that this was a technical foul, right? And then we are on our way to success in terms of adjudicating the play properly. All right, a really straightforward uh, rules question there. We like the straightforward. We like the simple. Let's move on now to our very next rules question. When is it permissible for a player who has blood on his or her uniform to remain in the game while blood exists on that uniform? 
A, when an official determines the blood has not saturated the uniform. B, when medical personnel determine the blood has not saturated the uniform. C, never. If the uniform has any amount of blood on it, it shall not be worn. Or D, none of the above. Right? National Federation of High School Basketball Rules makes things really simple here. Really simple. If there is any amount of blood on a uniform, that uniform may not be worn and that player may not participate. Our correct answer here is C, never. If the uniform has any amount of blood on it, it shall not be worn, right? The, we could, you know, if we're working with a official who does collegiate, there may be, you know, we bring in this like saturation and, and medical personnel determine and all this. National Federation of High School, everything is really simple, straightforward. Blood on a uniform may not participate. Now it can be resolved, right? And understanding how things have to be resolved with blood uh, uniform. The uniform, the player could leave, get the uniform washed, return to the game wearing that same uniform, legal by rule, right? Or the player could leave come back with a replacement jersey. And that replacement jersey could be an extra jersey that the team has, or it could be a jersey that's currently being worn by a team member on the bench. All of these things are legal. Understanding how to resolve blood situations is critical to our success as basketball officials. So it's something we'd have to anticipate here. All right, let's move on. Another rules question. Which of these scenarios results in a violation? A. A1 jumps to try for goal, but realizing it will be blocked, drops the ball to the floor and starts a dribble. B. A1 dribbles a second time after losing control of the first dribble because an opponent touches the ball. C. A1 jumps to try for goal, but the ball is knocked out of his or her hands. A1 retrieves the ball in the air and lands and starts a new dribble, or D, A1 loses the ball in an attempt to end his or her dribble. A1 takes three steps to where the ball is and is able to retrieve the ball. A1, after picking the ball up off the floor, passes to teammate A3, right? So these are four pretty common scenarios and one that like our brain has to do a little processing on. Why don't we start at the one on the bottom? A1 loses the ball in an attempt to end the dribble. Dribble, 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 goes to pick up the ball and fumbles it. It bounces away. They go and retrieve the ball, pick it up, and pass to a teammate. Is that legal? Right? A player can dribble, fumble, and pick up. A player can always regain control of a ball that they have lost control of. That would be a legal play. C. A1 jumps to try for goal, but the ball is knocked out of their hands. So they're going up. The ball is, uh, you know, the defender contacts the ball. It's like suspended in midair. They then re-grab the ball, land, and start dribbling again. Is that legal? Yes. Yes, it is. B, A1 dribbles a second time after losing control of the first dribble because an opponent touched the ball. When a player is dribbling and an opponent touches the ball that causes a loss of control, that dribble has ended by rule. That player is completely free to pick up the ball and dribble anew. So our correct answer on this play is A. A player may not lift their pivot foot and begin a dribble. It refers to our first question of the day, something that's really straightforward and understanding that we have to have to properly adjudicate plays, traveling plays. We like the simple. We like basics. We like things that we could take with us onto the basketball court. Okay, awesome. All right. Let's take a look now at another rules question. In which of these scenarios will an overtime period always occur if A1 is assessed a technical foul after the expiration of time to end regulation? A, when the score is tied, 
B, when team A is ahead by a point, C, when team B is ahead by a point, or D. None of these scenarios guarantee that an overtime period is played, right? So imagine our scenario. Game ends and somebody does, a player, bench personnel, does something so egregious that we are going to assess a tactical foul, right? This is, in this situation, right? Crazy, like a lot of energy, confusion. We're going to have to adjudicate this play properly. So we have to understand when technical fouls occur after the end of playing time, what to do next. If the result of the attempting the technical foul free throws would not affect the outcome of the game, then we will assess the technical foul and no free throws will be shot. If the team is, the opponent is trailing and the result of those technical foul free throws would affect the, the result of the game, then we will consider those technical foul free throws to be part of the previous period. We will attempt the free throws and the result of the free throws will determine what happens next in the game. But one constant is if the score is tied at the end of regulation and then subsequently a technical foul occurs, that technical foul is considered to be part of the overtime period that follows. So our correct answer on this play is B, when the score is tied and a player technical is assessed, it would actually be a bench technical is assessed, then we will begin the overtime period with the adjudication of that. We would begin with two free throws and the ball for division line throw in opposite the table. So that's our correct ruling on that play. It's a good one. Got our brain thinking, right? But just imagine the scenario as well. We're at the end of the game and then a technical foul occurs. This is not going to be common. And we would, you know, if we, it's what's really essential here is that we adjudicate the play properly. If we make a mistake at this point of the game, the, the team that's affected may have no opportunity co to correct from our mistake, right? If we awarded free throws as part of the fourth period when they should not have been awarded as part of the fourth period and the game ends, right? We have made a, an egregious mistake. So understanding here is really critical so that we can get things right. All right, fantastic. Let's look now at our final rules question for the day. Team A requests a 60-second timeout, which is granted by the official. After 30 seconds have passed, Team A is ready to play. Team B wants to use the entire timeout. Can the length of the timeout be shortened? A. Yes, if Team A is ready to play, Team B will not be able to use the entire timeout. B. Yes, Team A must declare before the timeout it would only like to use 30 seconds. C. No, Team B can use 90 seconds if they would like. Or D. No. Team B is entitled to use the entire timeout. Kind of comical answers there. The, the concept is simple. Once a timeout begins, right, we, uh, we report the, to the table, we're using a 60-second timeout. Start, we begin the timeout interval. Both teams are entitled to the full use of that timeout period. Once the period is ended, then we will resume play. If Team A, who requested the timeout, just wanted a quick get-together and now we're ready to play. Hey, ref, we're ready to play. It's not their timeout anymore. We are into the timeout. We're going to use the full time, right? The opponent certainly has the opportunity to use all of that time for a timeout. Now, if uh, Team A comes out quickly, Team B comes out quickly, there's still another 30 seconds to go in the timeout. Now, in this instance, absolutely, we can rescind. No, we're not going to rescind. We're just going to resume. We don't have to wait until the end of the, uh, of the period. There's no reason to do that. So that's our correct adjudication.
or did we get it? Our correct adjudication is no. Team B is entitled to use the entire timeout. Pretty much common sense on that one. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Basketball Rules Expert. If this is the video content that you find valuable, time to do all the things. Hit like, subscribe, and notify so you don't miss out on any of our new content. Get notified when we go live. We go live two times a week, every Wednesday and Friday, 7 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Eastern. Allow me a moment. Our tremendous show supporters, Jeffrey Jewett, Gary Mouton, Ashton Dillon, Dan Kelly, and Les O'Connor Jr. Much appreciated and much love. You want to support the show, you can always head to a betterofficial.com slash coffee. I'll put a link above and in the show notes below. Awesome. All right, we have additional video content available for you here. I've made this choice. YouTube has made this choice. You make your choice. We'll see you in the very next video.